A reading from the book of Genesis. Now the serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So, the woman, so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. And I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten the tree of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, Is this what you have done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. If you are ever in need to practice of a, of a practice to help you cultivate the virtue of humility, may I suggest that you take a trip to IKEA and pick up a nice piece of furniture. If you're anything like me, you will fall prey to what I call the Murphy's Law of IKEA. Everything that can be done incorrectly will be, but won't be noticed until much, much later. It seems that every piece of furniture I've had to put, uh, put together has to be taken apart and redone with constant reference to the instructions, not once, but maybe two or three times. I look at the instructions not to learn how to build the furniture, but to answer the question, where did I go wrong? <laughs> We sometimes treat our text uh, today just like that. We look around the world and we see so much conflict, violence, sin, and suffering. We are naturally driven to ask the question, question, where did it go wrong? Where did we go wrong? To put it in theological terms, what was the original sin? And what better passage than Genesis 3 to answer this question? This impulse isn't wrong. We can and should learn a great deal from this passage about humanity, God, and sin. We see how humanity did not accept harmonious community with one another and God, but saw God as a rival. We, shall see, we see how sin breaks community and estranges us, makes us strangers from God, from one another, from creation itself, and even from ourselves. In this brief story, we, see, we get a snapshot of the predicament in which we find ourselves, hiding from God, in conflict with each other, enslaved to our appetites, and in discord with creation itself. And on this reading, which is a good reading, we recognize our need for salvation, for God to come and set things back on the right course. Genesis 3 is the problem that God answers with Jesus. This is a linear reading of the story, right? We have a primal or original harmony, which is, which is disrupted and broken by sin, and that harmony needs to be restored. Creation leads to fall, leads to redemption. I think this story has more to it than that. I think the linear reading, while not wrong, needs to be deepened and enriched. First, I think if we only had a linear reading, I think it lets us off the hook too easily reading this text. 
We want to explain the evil in the world. We turn to the Bible. Ah, we see here we can blame our original parents, Adam and Eve, for why the world is the way it is. We can turn to the passage and answer the question, why are things the way they are? And we can come away with a reading that explains and justifies the present disorder in the world. Conveniently answering our question without making us accountable for the ways in which we perpetuate that disorder in our own lives. The second reason, so I think one is, is it lets us too much off the hook. The second reason I want to enrich and challenge a purely linear reading of the story is because of Jesus. In the Christian faith, Jesus Christ is not God's plan B, a writing of a primordial or original wrong, but the original intention of God all along. That is why, after the Easter resurrection, followers of Christ immediately change their understanding of how God's relationship with creation works. Contrast Adam and Eve having their eyes opened with the disciples at Emmaus having their eyes opened when they recognize Christ. The New Testament is full of a cosmological Christology, if we want to use a theological phrase. Or to simply put it, for the writers of the New Testament, you cannot talk about God's relationship with creation without talking about Jesus Christ. Creation came into being through Christ, is held together by Christ, and is moving forward for Christ. This is the revelation of the New Testament. Not that God uses Jesus as a tool, a kind of band-aid, to bring us back to a time before we needed him, but that in encountering the resurrected Jesus, we enter into a new cosmos, a new universe, in which death is not. In the Christian faith, we must always begin with the answer God has given us in the resurrected Christ in order to understand properly the original problem. Taking the medicine and becoming whole reveals to us just how sick and broken we were in the first place. So what does it mean to read Genesis 3 after encountering the risen Jesus? Paul tells us that the whole point of original sin is that it shows us how far-reaching our redemption in Christ is. The free gift of God's grace to us exiled sinners does not answer all of the problems that we think we have. In its abundance, it answers the problems that we didn't know we had in the first place. This is the gospel. Before we were able to understand just how far our lives were constituted by sin and death, God reconciled us and brought us out of darkness into his wonderful light. So the doctrine of original sin, and indeed of of all sin, is not something that we have to teach people first in order to show them how they need Christ. Rather, it is a backward glance into that slavery into which we were born and which we could not recognize until rescued by the God for whom death is not. Amen.